would like to introduce your speakers for today. Elena Gavin is Chief Strategy Officer at First Stop Health. She is a market strategy and product growth leader with 10 plus years in the, in the employee benefits space who is passionate about delivering quality, high engagement, and equitable digital health solutions to the market. She is responsible for growth, marketing, and product collaborations at First Stop Health. Delight Figura is Director of Client Care at First Stop Health. She is responsible for managing a team of client care specialists who routinely interact with First Stop Health clients. She is passionate about doing what's best for First Stop Health clients and their employees and is a key contributor to the company's plus 89 client net promoter score and 85% client retention rate. Elena, you have the floor. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that introduction. I want to thank our hosts and for all of you for joining today. First Stop Health is a virtual care company that has been supporting employers and their employees for over a decade, and we have over 700,000 members in all 50 states. We are thrilled to be here today to discuss an overwhelmingly important topic of mental health and mental health care access. This is one that is not only important to me personally, but academically was my area of study during my tenure at the University of California, Berkeley, where I received my Master's of Business and Public Health. And it has been an incredibly important area to focus on at First Stop Health as well. Today, we'll be reviewing a few pieces around this mental health crisis. First, we'll start off by level setting and getting an understanding of the state of mental health in the United States today with a particular slant at how it impacts employers and their employees. We'll review the numerous barriers to care that many patients face when seeking access and how virtual care can help overcome a significant number, if not all of those barriers. I will turn the microphone over to my colleague, Del Del Delai, in order to give her a, uh, a chance to talk about some case studies for our current clients. Um, and then we'll end the discussion around the interplay and incredibly um, inexorable link between physical and mental health, um, leaving some time for Q&A at the end. So if we go to the next slide, and then the one after that, perfect. So we're going to start with some statistics today. And these all have to do with better understanding the true prevalence rate or existence of mental health issues among adults in the United States. Today, one in four U.S. adults experience suboptimal mental health. Pre-COVID, that number was one in five. So that number is getting worse over time. Significantly, 50% of U.S. adults will be diagnosed with a mental illness in their lifetime. Now, some may be asking, what is the difference between suboptimal mental health and a mental illness? And we'll get into that in a moment, but those are two very different statistics and importantly so. Of those who are diagnosed with a mental illness, only two out of five receive any treatment at all in their lifetime, which is a staggeringly low statistic. And that becomes even worsened when we think about the fraction of those who actually receive efficacious treatment. Efficacious meaning it is substantially reducing mortality and morbidity, that that care is effective. And then perhaps one of the most staggering statistics is around the interplay between physical and mental health. Those who have a chronic illness are three times as likely to develop a mental illness. Likewise, those with a diagnosed mental illness, like depression, are more likely to develop a chronic disease. Mm -hmm. This impacts not just mental health care, but health care at large. Chronic disease represents 50% on average of an employer's claim spend and a significant impact on patients' lives and outcomes and health. So this really moves from being siloed into a problem around mental health into a problem around healthcare in general. If you go to the next slide, I'd like to introduce us to a concept that I just alluded to um, that is not new in the academic world, but is relatively new to the employee benefits world as we have started to adopt virtual mental health, virtual behavioral health, and mental well-being solutions into our employee benefits packages. 
And that's this idea of the dual access of mental health. And this means that there is a difference between the presence of a mental illness that has been diagnosed, which you'll see along the x-axis of this graph, horizontal, and the day-to-day -day status of a patient's mental wellness, which is on the vertical y-axis. What this means is that you can be diagnosed with a mental illness and at any given moment have optimal health or suboptimal health as a function of how easy it is to receive health care, whether or not an individual is taking prescribed medication, socioeconomic factors, and societal factors and environmental factors that implicate a patient's ability to have optimal mental health. Why is this important? Mental health is so much more complex than a binary or than a single spectrum. If we broaden our definition of mental health and mental wellness, we really start to see that there are more opportunities to intervene, more opportunities to care for people who were perhaps previously not considered as needing support. No matter where you exist on the spectrum, there is value in seeking and receiving affordable mental health care. And the goal of every employer and payer and organization that delivers care should be to have people be in a state of flourishing, a state of optimal mental health, existing on the top section of this graph, regardless of the presence of a diagnosed mental disorder or a lack of a diagnosis of a mental disorder. This becomes incredibly important, if you go to the next slide, in the wake of COVID-19. We know that COVID-19 has had a dramatic impact not only on the presence of mental health issues in our country, which COVID-19 has triggered a 25% increase in anxiety and depression and stress, but it has also given rise to an increased awareness around the importance of adding mental health and whole person well-being solutions in the workplace, even before symptoms present, even for, before a patient asks for help. There is a preventive element of mental health that we need to consider in order to do right by the people that we care for. And if you go to the next slide, this becomes ever more important when you consider the ranging impacts of mental health issues that go unaddressed. Not only does it cause a situation where a patient is living in a suboptimal condition, but it has negative impacts on an organization. Folks with mental health dynamics have lower productivity, lower job performance, are less engaged in their work, have trouble communicating with coworkers, and often have trouble with daily functions. In fact, mental health is projected to result in $16 trillion of lost output and productivity by 2030. Now, I want to give you a little bit of an understanding of, of where this sits in relation to other conditions. This outpaces monetary losses driven by every single other major chronic disease that we know about in the physical realm. And mental health is on pace to be the single largest health risk to workplace productivity and talent retention and individual employee happiness. And that is why, according to a Willis Towers Watson study and many other studies, we know that over 70% of employers in 2022 plan to boost behavioral health services virtual care services, and other whole person well-being services in order to address this fact. So I want to go to the next slide, which is a first poll. We'd like to better understand which mental health issues concern the folks on this call today, which mental health issues concern your employee population, which concern your clients. And as you take a moment to indicate your choice here, I would like to mention that we've done our own research internally with our clients and with our patients. Across our 700,000 members, we surveyed a subset. We asked them to name across every health issue, physical or behavioral, which condition concerns them the most. Overwhelmingly, managing stress, anxiety, and mental health conditions came in number two, very close to concern around energy, sleep, and weight loss. It is a significant concern for not just patients, but also the employees that they represent. So I think it takes a little bit of time for these results to come through, and here we are. That's in line with what we've seen. Stress, 37% of you are saying stress is a significant factor, 23% are saying anxiety, and 11% are saying depression. 
with 16% saying family and work issues. That is very in line with what we're seeing both in how we serve our patients with virtual mental health today and how that poll uh, came out when we surveyed the patients across our entire book of business. So keep that in mind as we move forward. We're gonna jump into barriers to care here. Um, and they range between access issues, cost issues, equity issues, and efficacy issues. So we'll start with access. Finding mental health care is incredibly difficult today. First, people often don't know how to ask for help or if they should. And when they do, they often don't know where to start. Patients are met with long wait times when they finally find a provider that they would like to see. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Number one, we have here that coverage does not equal access. What does that mean? Legally, ACA compliant plans are mandated to cover mental health at parity with physical health. But that does not mean that those patients are guaranteed to get access to in-network providers. A large percent of mental health providers do not accept commercial insurance. Out of network is extremely expensive for patients and often prohibitive. In fact, only 56% of psychiatrists nationwide accept commercial insurance as compared to 90% of other non-mental health physicians. This access issue is exacerbated by the fact that there is a shortage or a lack of providers who specialize in mental health areas. 77% of U.S. counties do not have enough mental health providers to treat the demand that is recognized, let alone the demand that is going unrecognized. And that's when you include licensed clinical social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, and other clinicians that deliver this type of care, like primary care physicians. This number is exacerbated and gets worse when you look at rural environments and socioeconomically depressed areas. If you go to the next slide, this is a visual of what this looks like from a state-by-state -state basis in the United States. We have here a map from Mental Health America that represents access to care rankings by state. Nine measures make up these rankings, things like the number of adults and the percentage of adults with a diagnosed acute mental disorder who either did not receive treatment or did not report having an unmet need or inadequate treatment. Likewise, this is a measured uh, um, amongst youth cohorts as well. And we see here that the states in orange, dark orange and red are struggling significantly as compared to the states in yellow. And what this means is that if a patient is restricted to only seeing doctors in person, a doctor near their location, there is a massive inequity in access as a function of where you live. This map becomes even more dramatic when you break it down by county and by zip code. And so it's incredibly important to address this provider access issue and the inequity that exists across the United States. The next slide talks a little bit about cost issues. We know that patients on average spend between $65 to $250 per traditional therapy session, which lasts around 60 minutes. Those costs go up when a patient is paying out of pocket because they can't identify an in-network provider who will see them within a timely manner. On average, employees experiencing mental health distress use an additional $3,000 of services each year. And this translates into employer costs as well. Patients with mental health conditions cost, plan, cost plans over $15,000 per year. And there has been a 50% increase in mental health spending in the last 10 years for employers on things like therapy, prescriptions, rehabilitation facilities. And that number is only going up as substance use disorders increase, as anxiety increases and depression increases. The last barrier I want to speak about is the issues around efficacy and equity of care on the next slide. We know that less than 50% of Americans who have a mental disorder get proper treatment. Less than 10% of patients receive efficacious treatment, treatment that actually makes an impact on their lives, and yet they're paying for it. That number gets worse when you break the data down by demographic, socioeconomic status. For example, the percentage of black Americans who are able to access treatment is only about half that of white Americans. Historically and continuing today, BIPOC communities have less access and higher barriers to access to care for mental health than non-BIPOC communities. There are a few reasons why there is a significant lack of efficacy around mental health solutions. One, it's very often that providers in a fee-for-service environment 
are not properly incentivized or reimbursed to drive towards resolution or outcome. We also know that patients in those rural environments with geographic limitations are rarely paired with providers who have domain expertise in the area of need. For example, an individual who seeks LGBTQIA plus specific support may be at a disadvantage if they live in a rural area where the only providers that they have access to do not specialize in that. And so it's incredibly important to take into consideration the barriers that exist from a geography perspective as it relates to domain expertise. We're going to move on to talk a little bit about how virtual care can help solve some of these issues. So, so thinking about the positive aspects of how the industry has evolved and how we're looking into the future of, of solutioning for some of these problems. If you go to the next slide. We know for a fact, and as demonstrated through COVID, that the convenience of a virtual visit significantly increases utilization of services, reduces missed visits, and increases access for people in rural environments and geographic areas where there are limitations. We also know that a part of this better access is a function of time. People receiving in-person traditional care from mental health professionals wait weeks up to months in order to get a new patient and follow-up appointment. Most virtual behavioral health solutions are getting access to providers within days. This is incredibly important when trying to treat acute and chronic mental health conditions, timeliness of care. There's also a decreased fear of stigma around going to a mental health appointment when it is conducted virtually from the psychological safety of a patient's home. They have reduced costs, not only for themselves, but for the plan, especially when a patient is in a capitated model where utilization is incentivized and a patient does not incur a fee for every single use of the service. We know that patients are also better aligned often in virtual primary, virtual mental health environments. When a patient has a need and it's identified by a solution, those solutions often work incredibly hard to match providers who are available with domain expertise so that that patient can receive high quality care for what they need. And lastly, virtual mental health solutions offer a significant amount of population level health data on the efficacy of the program, which employers can and should be using to evaluate their current programming and making decisions moving forward so that they can optimize health for their employees. We'll move on to our second poll. We are going to ask you to discuss which results you feel you get with your mental health program. So some of you may not have a mental health program in place or it may be embedded and not frequently used. Feel free to indicate that. Some of you might not know what your results are because you don't have a significant amount of reporting, that's okay too. But for those of you who have a program and those of you who know, we'd love to hear what your results are with that program. We're hoping and thinking that the majority of you are on this call because you know how important this programming is. And so hopefully your programming is working for you and we see more excellence than averages or minimals. But we are looking forward to the results here. All right. So the majority of you either don't know about the results of your programming or don't have a program in place today. We have a few folks who are minimally satisfied, that they don't get much use, are on average satisfied, it's what they expected, and very few of you are thrilled with the results of your mental health program. I want to say I'm sorry that that's the case, but I do believe there are ways to improve that, not only in picking the right partner, but also in understanding how to maximize the efficacy of the program and utilization. And that's a perfect segue for me to turn it over to my colleague, Delai, who is going to go through a few case studies of clients we have today and specifically highlight how we got their patients engaged and excited about using our solution. Thank you, Elena. Next slide, please. So before we actually dive into our first case study, let's look at who the employer profile is. They are a commercial trucking company that provides specialized trucking equipment and machinery solutions. Their workforce is compromised 82% males, and over half of their population is constantly moving, crossing state lines, and always on the go. While the company prides itself on providing tools to support mental health care, 
for their drivers through their EAP, it yielded minimal results. That is when they sought the assistance of First Stop Health. Next slide, please. Let's discuss the key challenges that were top of mind for leaders. Anxiety, isolation, depression. Drivers are a highly vulnerable population. They combat high anxiety on the job due to strict local and federal highway requirements. They are days and weeks away from their homes, families, and friends, causing isolation. Lastly, they're constantly exposed to the daily dangers of the road and potentially radical behaviors of drivers. Therefore, this employer required a solution that went beyond a traditional EAP so that they could truly support their employees' mental health well-being. Having an unbalanced mental state of mind for you and I can cause a bad email or a missed checkbox on a web page. Compare that responsibility to a truck driver going 70 miles per hour on an interstate highway with a thousand tons of cargo. A bad day for a driver can mean the lives of others, motorists, destruction to property, and even more so their own lives. That is why the employer chose us. First Stop Health was able to successfully able to support and promote the mental well-being for drivers so that they can have a safe space to talk to a licensed counselor, whether it was in their truck or at a rest area, versus the alternative of waiting weeks or possibly months to get treatment at a brick and mortar office when they so happen to be in the area. Instead, our counselors are available for phone or video visits. Our solution was flexible such that it would allow the counselor to meet the driver virtually even when they were on the job or even on their lunch break from a long haul. Next slide, please. Let's dive into what our solution was able to provide. As I just alluded, 24-7 access to licensed counselors who can provide emotional support to their employees and not have to rely on their managers to provide mental health support. Through our mobile app, website, or, or, or through a phone call, a driver can request a counseling visit within seconds. There's no caps or restrictions on the number of concerns a driver could have called in for, meaning that a driver was able to call in today for anxiety-related concern, and the next month can also call in for another concern. Above all, there was no cost associated to the employee to use the service. Next slide, please. So now that you're abreast of the situation and the solutions that we've offered, let's talk numbers and talk a little bit more about their actual results. Over the past two years, the organization has had 500 mental health visits. Employees used First Stop Health during the height of the pandemic when anxiety was rampant due to social and national unrest. Where employees were continuously burdened with additional work because of employee shortages. Furthermore, we also saw over year over year improvement of the benefit by seven percentage points. Truck drivers had the chance to feel supported whenever they were experiencing depression or needed assistance to cope with family and even more so um, grief or even substance abuse. So now that concludes our journey of our first case study. Let's go through the next slide to talk a little bit more about our second case study. <clears throat> now, um, I've gone ahead and presented a different employer and it's a little bit more um, unique in the sense that the one that I previously spoke about was a blue collar workforce and this one is more aimed at magnifying the glass at a white collar workforce. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, the work, this particular organization transitioned 100% to remote work. One third of their population ranged between 30 to 39, meaning their lifestyles changed drastically during a stage in their lives where they're beginning new milestones in their family or personal lives, while their professional careers are really ramping up. Furthermore, the employer had 
very limited resources to address and support mental health needs for their population, which is why they sought our guidance. As we move on to the next slide, let's go ahead and really take a magnifying glass to look at their set of challenges that leadership brought and was struggling with. Remote workforce and employees that were fatigued, high stress, a workforce that because of all of this, their productivity really decreased. So with that being said, questions range not only did they have these different key challenges at their top of mind, but they also asked questions from how can we prevent our employees stress levels, burnt out, fatigue? How should employees manage stress? In the event of burnt out, which is an act, you know, it, it is going to happen, or a, a fatigue em um, employee, what tools are available to reverse those symptoms and more importantly, to prevent them in the future? To address these concerns, the organization wanted to offer a mental health care service which they could empower employees to foster a safe space to cultivate productivity and plan accordingly for tasks or project deadlines while also focusing on a work-life balance. Furthermore, our client was so thrilled about our implementation process that wasn't lengthy at all, nor did they have to submit an additional eligibility file to get up and running. Implementation for this group took less than two weeks, and First Health Health ensured to shoulder all of the communications of engagement for their employees. Let's move on to our next slide to take a closer look as to how and why they chose First Health Health and also how First Stop Health can drive member engagement to use the service. First, as I alluded earlier on, our program would be one-stop shop for their employees, where it can provide both support for their mental and physical well-being. Having one product that offers virtual care was really, really something that drew to them. Number two, our ability to engage employees and drive high utilization was far over. By partnering with us, we were able to educate members on when and how to use the benefit. Our engagement strategy was year long. This is important because while it's crucial to communicate a benefit during open enrollment or when somebody gets hired, we really believe that usage increase, and that's what we've also seen historically in our data, is driven by consistent communication, informing the member about the service year long. By design, we made communications to be nimble and intentional for their workforce, while also addressing the current healthcare needs in real time that unfolds around mental health. We made sure that our communications would embody their employees but also the employer as a whole. The third reason why they chose First Stop Health is because of our approach to care to make it frictionless. Our system and providers is both functional, such that it can serve a millennial or a baby boomer, or it can even serve any age group or even family dynamics that happen. We know that there's a huge stigma around mental health and it takes courage for members to even think of using such services. Thus, we put the power on the member on how we would like to request a visit. Let's go ahead and now look at the actual results. The demand for immediate mental health care was evident when we spoke in conversation with our clients. The client's workforce loved digital communication to, for employees, but we really needed to make sure that we took the digital approach to the next level. That is why we decided to incorporate in our emails thoughtful blogs and high impact videos that really focused and destigmatized mental health and brought awareness about the program. All in all, at the end of the program, we were able to achieve 38% utilization and more importantly, 54% of members open at least one email, which reveals that the content was powerful and it resonated at the individual level. 
we really attributed this all in all because of our communications that we have in place that really bring forth to light mental health and how important it is to achieve a balanced one. I hope, next slide. I hope you all found these case studies informational. Having a beneficial mental health, um, having a benefit around mental health should be a goal that all employers should strive to prioritize in the workplace. Doing so, it brings the best out of employees so that they can be their best selves for their employers, their customers, their families, and overall community. Thank you all so much for your time. May the force be with you today, and I'll leave you in good hands of wonderful Elena. Thanks, Delay. That was wonderful. <clears throat> and I'd just like to, to emphasize that the most important thing that a employee benefits program can do is be used. Investing in these programs, investing your time and your resources in these programs is only beneficial if your employees and their family members actively know about and use these solutions. And that is something that we strive for across all of our solutions. And regardless of who you partner with, should be a major focus in order to make sure that you are getting the most out of the dollars that you're spending. I'd like to take a little bit of time, as promised, to talk a little bit about the relationship between physical and mental health as it relates to virtual care. And we've, we've talked a little bit about how mental and physical conditions are interrelated and really must be treated together. The outcomes of each are correlated. A particularly great example of this is if you look at primary care. Primary care physicians nationally identify that one third of their patients are truly mental health patients, patients needing mental health care above all else. And they are trained to and routinely treat a wide variety of psychiatric conditions and prescribe psychological and psychiatric medications. A great example of this comorbidity environment is most a significant percentage of and most gastrointestinal issues that are not related to autoimmune disorders are a function of or exacerbated by stress and anxiety. A patient going in exclusively to receive mental wellness and mental health care without being treated appropriately by their primary care physician or their physical care doctor will only be seen as partially symptomatic. There will only be a partial view of that patient's whole person wellness journey, and you really must include both. Primary care is an incredible way to do that, specifically because primary care physicians are trained in clinical interviewing as their primary method of assessment and motivational interviewing to understand a patient's capacity for change and to take a hold of their own healthcare journey. They can also refer patients to mental health specialists for additional care and really be a clinical front door for a patient who may otherwise not know that they need or be able to access that type of care. If you go to the next slide, we talk a little bit about how we think about virtual primary care delivering help to mental health patients. Virtual primary care is primary care delivered virtually via phone, via video. In this environment, patients can schedule with their preferred doctor, build trust with that physician, see that doctor as many times as they need to for follow-up visits or questions without risk of additional penalty of cost, really emphasizing the importance of using the solution and seeking care and appointments on average within three days. Those doctors treat the whole person, physical and mental conditions. Specifically, this becomes important when the doctor conducts routine wellness screenings. Our physicians screen every patient for things like presence of domestic violence, psychological safety, anxiety, depression, and many other mental health conditions. Often, the patients who come to us are coming to us for a completely different reason. Some of the patients who come to us through virtual urgent care, virtual telemedicine, come to us for a rash, a chronic UTI, and we, through relationship, can develop and uncover chronic persistent conditions, mental health related or otherwise, that would really implicate a patient's long-term chronic health. We also know that primary care physicians are often the first place a patient goes when they need care and have a responsibility to refer out appropriately 
to existing benefits programs or other mental health services when needed. And this is incredibly important if you have existing programs, mental health or otherwise, that need additional utilization or steerage. And finally, our primary care physicians do a tremendous amount of work with medication management and adherence. More SSRs, SSRIs, things like fluoxetine and Prozac, are prescribed by primary care physicians than they are by specific mental health clinicians because often those are the folks seeing those types of patients first. And so being able to manage those types of medications and help patients understand the importance of adherence becomes an incredible tool in helping a patient take control of their own health journey. So this is important because as you think about looking at the holistic benefits package, even if you're looking at something that isn't mental health specific, it should have implications in bolstering mental health services or at least steering navigation-wise to the services that you already have in place. We'll summarize what we talked about today in the next slide and the slide after that. We've discussed how mental health really is a crisis and it's not just a mental health crisis, it is a full healthcare crisis and help is needed. The barriers to care exist around access, cost, equity and inclusion and virtual care has the potential to really change the landscape of how people access this care and the financial structures that exist that underlie an often ineffective system. We know from a University of Chicago study that for every $1 invested in a mental health solution, virtual or otherwise, the employer can often see an ROI of three to $5. That's an incredible investment and an important one that should be made, made not just from a financial perspective, but for the, for the well-being and the betterment of all peoples involved. And then finally, regardless of what you do with your benefits package, if you are looking at other solutions, even if they're not specifically related to mental health, we really encourage you to think about how they can implicate and improve the mental health conditions in your population. I'll close out by just reviewing the list of services that we do offer. As I mentioned, we've been supporting folks for 10 years now in all 50 states with telemedicine, which is 24 seven virtual urgent care. We also offer virtual primary care where patients can interact with their chosen doctor at a routine cadence at no cost to them. And we also offer virtual mental health where patients can interact with a dedicated licensed master's level clinician with on average 18 plus years of experience to really target the issues that they're facing at home, at work, in their life with a focus on solution-focused counseling so that we can be resolution-focused and really get patients in a better state. So I want to pause now to give everybody a chance to ask any questions that they have in the chat. Any that we don't get to answer today, we will make sure to follow up with you directly with our answers and more information. Um, but it, I think we have a few questions coming in, um, so I will pause and let those trickle in. All right, perfect. And as a reminder, to, type a, to ask a question, please use the Q&A panel at the bottom right side of your screen. Please type your question into the text field and hit send. Please keep the drop down as all panelists. All right, we do have a couple questions coming in. The first question is, what is the top mental health issue in your virtual service? I can go ahead and take that. Um, so it's not unlike what I discussed earlier as evidenced in our survey. So the top conditions really are stress, anxiety, and depression. Now, we do have a significant number of patients coming in with questions around substance use, grief, domestic violence, and higher acuity conditions that also need to be treated, um, not just stress, anxiety, and depression. When a patient is coming in with conditions that are higher acuity, our counselors will work with them to make sure that they feel they have an individual sort of quarterbacking their care. And if additional support is needed or in-person support is needed that is beyond the bandwidth of what virtual care can support, we will support referrals and recommendations into additional services. For example, if someone needs a rehabilitation facility. So we are fully taking into account the appropriateness of virtual care in some circumstances, but we mostly see stress, anxiety, workplace stress, depression, and grief. That's a great question. Great, thank you. Uh, another question we have 
How long is each virtual counseling visit? I can take that. So typically on average, uh, the counseling visit is 45 to 60 minutes long with the counselor and the patient. There might be times where obviously that journey is a little bit longer, um, but really the goal here is to make sure that the member feels supported through their concern um, and that they're provided with tools and solutions to address those as well. Great, thank you. Our next question, what's the background of counselors' credentials? Yeah, that's a great one. Um, so the counselors that we have, they exist in all 50 states. Uh, we do uh, deploy only master's level clinicians who have had a graduate level of education in psychology, and that can be a licensed clinical social worker, uh, psychologist, and other types of clinicians. On average, our clinicians have more than 18 years of experience treating patients overall and a specific number of years working in an area of domain expertise. So for example, if I call in and I'm dealing with workplace stress, then I would be matched with a provider who specifically uses cognitive behavioral therapy techniques as it relates to managing workplace stress and interpersonal work relationships. And that person would be best suited to me as opposed to if I had called in dealing with the loss of a family member or dealing with a, a chronic disease that's implicating my mental wellness. Okay, great, thank you. And our next question, are counselors able to prescribe any medications? That's a great question. So overall, our, while our counselors are not able to prescribe any medications, what they will be able to do is refer the member to a higher level of care. Typically, it's more of a psychiatrist that would be able to provide a medication, and we just want to make sure we refer the member to the right and appropriate referral so that they can get the care that they need and also help them through their journey. Okay, great, thank you. And our next question, how does virtual mental health compare to my EAP? Yeah, that's a fantastic question and, and a really important distinguishing feature. So typically in an EAP, uh, there are restrictions on the number of visits that a patient can see. There are restrictions on the ability for a patient to be in a relationship with the same provider over time. So it's often very episodic versus a long-term relationship. And there are restrictions on total utilization. And we have really eliminated that environment. Our, our clinicians are constantly moderating what is appropriate for that patient, keeping in mind that it is solution focused. So our, the goal of our physicians, so rather the goal of our clinicians is to get a patient to a place of resolution. And if that can be done in six visits, then we want to optimize that for the patient. If that takes longer, then that takes longer. And so there really is a customized patient path that doesn't often exist in EAP programs, although there are many that have um, sort of emboldened services. So it's important to look at either the one you have available or others that you're looking at and compare those utilization and relationship dynamics. And if I don't, um, if you don't mind, I actually see a question coming in here that I think is incredibly important. It's a question around if there's an intake process to properly identify a person in crisis uh, who can't wait an average of three days for care, and if so, how does that work? So Karen, I wanna thank you for that. The, the process that we have here is designed to optimize in every single situation patient safety. There are cases where patients call in, just like on the telemedicine side, in emergent dynamics where we have to think quickly and engage with established protocols to make sure that that patient is receiving 911 emergency care and that we are staying on the line with that patient. Every patient who calls in the virtual mental health or contacts us electronically answers a series of questions around their own perception of psychological safety, domestic safety, if they believe that they're at risk of hurting themselves or others, and that clinician on the other end is making a separate assessment based on the voice and video behavior of that individual. If it is determined that that patient is at risk, 
then our clinicians are trained to contact emergency services and enact a protocol on the phone with that patient whereby they talk them through a crisis response process to keep them calm until help arrives. So it is incredibly important to think about how folks who are calling in often to hotlines um, are thinking, you know, are dealing with acute immediate issues and to the extent that we can solution for that in a crisis situation or otherwise, we want to. All right, thank you. And I do believe that that's our last questions. Any final thoughts? So Lai and I just want to thank everybody here for their attention and thoughtful questions. This is a really important topic and we work very hard to deliver care that people love and that people want to use and are very happy to talk about this topic at large or any specific questions that you might have about First Stop Health. And the webinar is being recorded. These slides will be made available if you are in contact with us um, and we're very happy to share additional information. So we will make sure to um, provide our contact information and we wanna thank you for your time today.